to speak to you tonight about cyborg feminism and the future of technology. Um, a little bit less about death and a little bit more about futures and how we can make them, uh, what we might want to, want to make the future into. So I want to start with a little bit of definitions here. So um, first, what are we talking about when we talk about cyborgs in this context of cyborg feminism? Um, we might be thinking of Seven of Nine, right? This like super sexy 24th century Star Trek Voyager cyborg. Um, we might be thinking a little bit less uh, sort of a <laughs> liberal paradise future uh, about uh, cyborg soldiers with night vision and uh, high-tech exoskeletons. Uh, we might be thinking of sort of slickly designed 22nd century androids, this sort of combination of advanced AI that might even have uh, feelings and agency uh, and uh, uh, super duper mechanical engineering. We might even be thinking about uh, some real life cyborgs that exist today. This is Neil Harbison of the Cyborg Foundation. And you can see this antenna on his head here. Uh, this is his cyborg uh, implant that allows him to hear uh, color. He was born colorblind and this augments his senses. We might also be thinking about transhumanism, right? This sort of global thought experiment to uh, think about how we can use technology to expand human capacities of intelligence and lifespan. My guide to cyborgs and to cyborg feminism is a little bit more ordinary, everyday, contemporary than all of those. My guide is the philosopher of technology, Donna Haraway, uh, a, a totally uh, sort of normal, uh, middle-aged, middle-American, middle-class uh, woman here with her dog, who inspires much of her writing. And this is the cyborg that Haraway is writing with. This is a cyborg um, drawn by her sometime collaborator, artist Lynn Randolph. And in her very famous paper, A Manifesto for Cyborgs, um, she kind of lays out this idea of the cyborg not necessarily as a thing that actually exists in the world, not necessarily as a sort of future thing that we can be concretely working towards, but as this kind of mixed material semiotic, uh, mixed uh, 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 physical and uh, ideological tool for thinking about what kinds of futures we want to bring into being. And so she writes, by the late 20th century, our time, a mythic time, we're all chimeras, theorized and fabricated hybrids of machine and organisms, in short, cyborgs. The cyborg is a, content, a condensed image of both imagination and material reality, the two join centers structuring any possibility of historical transformation. So again, the cyborg, the figure of the cyborg for cyborg feminism is this uh, joined figure, this figure that is both imaginary and that reflects some of our material realities um, that is both at the same time. The cyborg for Haraway also rejects the idea of original purity. The cyborg, she writes, is a creature in a post-gender world, it has no truck with bisexuality, pre oedipal symbiosis, unalienated labor or any other seductions for organic wholeness through a final appropriation of all of the powers of the parts into a higher unity. The cyborg skips the step of original unity, of identification with nature in the Western sense. So again, her cyborg is made of parts and it's not quite a whole. It's part of a body, it's organic material, it's electronic material, uh, it's of the stars, of the earth, and of the circuits. Um, and also of uh, both human life and animal life. And the cyborg rejects dualisms related to this previous point. And she writes, to recapitulate, certain dualisms have been persistent in Western traditions. They have all been systematic to the logics and practices of domination of women, people of color, nature, workers, animals. In short, domination of all constituted as others, whose task is to mirror the self. Chief among these troubling dualisms are self-other, mind, body, culture, nature, male, female, civilized, primitive, reality, appearance, whole part, agent, resource, maker, made, active, passive, right, wrong, truth, illusion, total, partial, God, and man. There are many dualisms that we can excavate from the Western tradition of philosophy and science, apparently. So again, right, this is a figure that is 
that is both nature and culture, that is both human and machine, that is both animal and human, that is both of the stars and of the earth. So what does this mean for the future of technology? So I'm going to lay out kind of three themes that the cyborg helps us think about and a few questions that that might raise for us, thinking about what kinds of futures we want to build with technology, what kinds of futures we want to build for technology, and who might be building them. So the first provocation of the cyborg is that we need to rewrite our origin myth. Starting with the origin myths from Western Judeo-Christian heritage. This myth of the Garden of Eden and of the fall of man sick, right? The fall of humans, really. Um, <laughs> um, but this, this myth that there was this original pure past, this uh, state of paradise, this state of nature, where human nature and God were unified before a tragic break, right? Before uh, Eve accepts the apple and Adam and Eve are thrown out of paradise. Right, so this means letting go of the myth of the one, right? So not only the, the one sort of unified, uh, Edenic, uh, way of life, uh, but also the sort of messianic one, the idea that there is a one technology, one person, one philosophy, one future that will come and save us from our brokenness. And it also means getting, letting go of the myth of the father, right? The myth of uh, a direction, the myth of a telos, of an endpoint, the myth of uh, a, a higher purpose, um, religious or secular, uh, but this myth that we have some absolute meaning that we can find uh, and that we should be working towards and that we are being directed to. It also means challenging the enlightenment heritage of the mind-body dualism, right? This idea that we are our mind and our mind is somewhere in our brain and our body is our possession, is the thing that our mind directs, is the thing that our mind knows the world through, but is not the same as our mind, as our person. We're not brains in vats, in other words. And this sort of heritage we can sort of very famously trace back in particular to Rene Descartes, uh, the philosopher with this sort of famous saying, cogito ergo sum, uh, je pense donc je suis, I think therefore I am. Right? This idea that, again, you are a mind who has a body, and this, you have this capacity to reflect as a mind separate from a body, separate from the world, on the world, um, and on the self. Another kind of dualism that the cyborg demands that we sort of rethink is the dualism introduced by psychoanalysis. The dualism of the Oedipal drama, the Oedipal complex. Um, this idea that... This idea that we, um, in our sort of psychic formation, have this break, again, this split from self and other, uh, from boy, child, and mother, from girl, child, and father, um, which is also a way to sneak in the gender binary into how we think about subject formation, something that feminists have been sort of rewriting, critiquing, uh, and trying to rework in psychoanalytic theory for decades. And the cyborg helps us do this in Haraway's provocation. So again, the cyborg skips the step of, of original unity. There is no unity between male and female, but there is some other sort of always already hybrid. Um, it skips the step of original unity in the sense of the unity of man and nature and God. There is no fall. Um, and it also skips the step of identification with nature in the Western sense. This idea of Eden, of purity, of man, of human being able to find its natural state, always seeking that state, seeking to go back to that, right? Sort of uh, tells the lie on the sort of paleo diet trends, right? We're never going to go back to paleo, if, even if we ever were, which we probably weren't. <laughs> And it also means that there's a possibility of, of getting rid of this myth of the machine in the garden. Um, this idea that um, we belong in nature, we are part of nature, and that any kind of technology uh, that we develop is coming in and disrupting that, is breaking that, is making us less pure and less good. When we get rid of, pure, of purity myths and of origin myths that stress purity, we also open up new spaces for technology to be a part of who we are rather than something that is degrading who we think we ought to be. 
Another thing the cyborg makes us pay attention to is the changing face of labor. So for one, the feminization of the workforce, uh, the growth of women laborers, women laboring outside of the home and still having to do the work in the home, the work of the home. And along with women uh, becoming larger and larger parts of the global workforce, uh, rapid de-skilling, uh, differentiation of wages between laborers and managers. Um, because much of the work that's being done is work that is not valued. It's not work of the mind, again, it's work of the body. It's work of care work, it's work of service work, it's work of making clothes, getting in there, using your hands, uh, providing the tools that we need to care for ourselves on a daily basis. And along with the feminization of labor, both in terms of statistics and in terms of ideology, there's also the idea of the expanding homework ecology, e economy, right? So this idea that we can all sort of work for ourselves, we can have careers without jobs, we are free agents, and if we just play our cards right, we can get magic money uh, sort of <laughs> spilling through the computer screen into our lap as we sit at home and have it all. And this is especially sort of emphasized in, um, uh, among sort of tech communities, among things like the blog, her conferences, right? This idea that as a woman, you can have children, you can have family, you can be a responsible mother, but you can work from home and be a CEO and have a business that is a blog and monetize it and uh, find stability for yourself, right? This is the dream, this is the goal uh, for many of us, for an increasing number of us as traditional employment fades away, um, but it is also uh, extremely precarious. Extremely precarious and extremely lonely, as anyone who has spent time working as a freelancer or academic knows very well. And this is not unrelated to this question of the uberification of labor, right? This mouthful sentence that we hear about on the news and in the think pieces and so on and so forth, right? Also the breakdown of the relationship between the employer and the worker. Uh, this, uh, this relationship that was very much sedimented as a two-way relationship with laborers having a relationship to employers and employers also having obligations towards their workers as well that seemed to be this golden moment in capitalism in the middle of the 20th century, these obligations are rapidly changing with workers owing more to their companies and companies owing less to their workers. And finally, the cyborg makes us think about how we might invent new metaphors for thinking about technology in society, for thinking about what technology means in a society with no pure state to which we are working back towards, but a society that is messy, always has been, and always will be. One of the metaphors coming out of science and technology studies, one of my fields, is the metaphor of actor networks, of actor network theory from, uh, among others, French philosopher Bruno Latour. Um, actor network theory lets us think about how humans are agents in technological systems, but so are the technologies, and so are the institutions in which technologies are developed and in which humans do their work. Uh, and so are the non-human organisms, the non-human laborers contributing to the system. Uh, the animals at, in, the, in the feedlot and the oysters in the bay, for example. Um, so we can think about uh, who is doing work and who is being exploited, who is being provided with opportunities uh, beyond the human species in order to rethink how these networks of power are working amongst ourselves in our own societies. Another metaphor from Marilyn Strathern, an anthropologist, is a metaphor of partial connections. If there is no pure state, if there is no originary wholeness, then how can we think about the networks, the connections, the relationships that we do build? Strathern proposes that we should think about them as always partial and always multiple. We do not have loyalty or, uh, or fealty to one particular and sole authority, but we have many loyalties, we have many relationships, and those relationships go in many directions of power. Those are relationships not only with individuals, but with institutions, with cultures, with traditions, with histories, and with non-humans. Of course, this is uncomfortable to think about in our Western world because partial connections also means partial disjunctions. 
Another metaphor, also borrowed from Donna Haraway, uh, is the idea of encounter value. What is there in the encounter between two living beings that is more than economic, that is more than an instrumental relationship, that maybe has value on its own terms? And again, she thinks this through in her relationship with her dog, woman and bitch. Per human and dog. Um, what is the value of that relationship that is more than a financial value, that is more than an instrumental value? Why the heck do we have these animals living in our houses in the first place? And the last metaphor, and a metaphor uh, that I think with, with the help of Donna Haraway, and that I visualize with the help of my colleague Ann Pasek, is the metaphor of weaving. How can we think with this traditionally uh, very much feminized art and, and think about the connections between us, think about the partial connections, think about the encounters and the value of those encounters, but also remain attentive to all of the work of weaving that goes into that. And part of that work of weaving is, of course, histories of weaving, histories of labors of weaving, histories of the exploitation of women and of children, and especially of young women and girls. And also histories of colonial expansion, histories of new market opportunities, histories of occupations and freedom movements. So with all of that said, what future then can cyborg feminism make? <coughs> So I think the first thing that cyborg feminism asks us to remember as we think about making futures with and for and through technologies is to remember that technology is made by people. We like to tell stories about technologies as though they are those agents of change, as though they are those higher powers in our Western mythos that are driving us forward uh, without any will exerted by us. But in fact, they are made by people and they do the things that people design them to do and use them to do. And therefore, we need to always keep in mind that technology furthers the interests of people and interrogate whose interests those are, uh, who is using technologies to what ends, uh, and who is receiving opportunities, and who is on the receiving end of oppression. Another thing that cyborg feminism asks us to remember is that progress is complicated. With no origin myth, with no Eden to loop back to, uh, with no telos to work towards, um, it becomes really complicated how we move forward. And of course, that's how we experience our lives. We experience life as a series of complications, as a series of crises, and a series of joys, uh, but nothing is ever simple or straightforward. And in thinking about how progress is complicated without these origin myths to guide us, without these origins to be seeking to return to, we do need to ask ourselves more critically and more, persistency, more persistently, who does progress leave behind? And who does progress make more vulnerable? Especially those on the edge of the labor market, especially those uh, already working uh, at the bottom rungs, already working in precarious spaces and times. Cyber feminism also asks us, what worlds can we make with what we have at hand? What practices that we're already using, what spaces of possibility, what challenges to authority, what remakings of the rules, reapplications in unusual ways, what do all of these practices already offer uh, in terms of new ways to think technology? And especially, what do feminized and undervalued practices offer in terms of new ways to think technology? In other words, what lessons might we learn from weaving? What futures might we learn to avoid from the histories of weaving? And finally, cyborg feminism asks us uh, to interrogate who needs to, who do we want to be in control of designing the cultures and economies of the future? Who are we designing for? Who are we designing with? Where are their voices in the process of making futures? And so to conclude, to loop back myself to Donna Haraway once again, always my guide through these questions, think we must. If there has ever been a time for the need seriously to think it is now, in these times when technology seems to be getting away from us, seems to be accelerating, when we don't know how to, how to curb it, how to use it, how to use it to make lives better rather than to make lives more different, 
think we must. Thank you. Go to nerdnight.com to find a Nerd Night event near you. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for our latest presentation.